working that and organizing, planning, setting those things up and taking full responsibility for it each morning and the other prayer meetings that we have as well. All right, let me get to the word of God that I have for you today. I am speaking on personal revival. Personal revival. Usually when we think and talk about revival, it's from a corporate perspective. We talk about the revival of a church, like we are talking about from we have been talking about from January. This church, this local church, or sometimes we, we are talking about the, a, a revival that affects a city, an island, or a country, a widespread corporate revival, or. Sometimes we are talking about revival that affects the entire world, a worldwide revival. And sometimes that's the focus, and that's not wrong, but sometimes that's the focus on the thinking when we think about or we are talking about revival. But corporate revival is the result of personal and individual revival. In other words, when you are revived, when I am revived, then together we will experience corporate revival. But it begins with each of us individually. In October of last year, at our pastoral staff planning meeting for this year, 2023, when I told the staff that I felt God wanted us to focus on revival this year, and gave me the same theme, revive us again. But at that time, I told them that I felt God wanted us to, to focus more on personal revival in each of our hearts. Because sometimes it's so easy for us to get distracted by thinking about all the other stuff that God might do and God is willing to do as far as revival is concerned outside of our own individual lives. And I still believe that is what God wants. And thus, I close this quarter out with this message, personal revival. Charles Finney, one of the great revivalist preachers in times past, and I'm going to use him in a little uh, in a little while. But Charles Finney, this great revivalist, said, revival starts with one person, you or me. That's how revival starts, with one person, each of us individually and personally. In Psalm 119, the psalmist mentions personal revival nine times in that psalm. Personal revival, where he focused on himself as it relates to revival. Not the revival of the entire nation of Israel, but revival in his own life and in his own heart. Let me read the verses that record it. In Psalm 119 and verse 25, the psalmist says, Revive me according to your word. Me, me. Revive me according to your word. In verse 37, he says, revive me in your way. Verse 40, he says, revive me in your righteousness. And verse 88, he says, revive me according to your loving kindness. In verse 107, he says, revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Verse 149, he says, revive me according to your justice. And verse 154, he says, revive me according to your word. Verse 156, the eighth time, he says, revive me according to your judgments. And lastly, verse 159, the psalmist says, revive me, O Lord, according to to your loving kindness. And so his focus was on himself. He wanted, to he wanted to experience the reviving power of God in his own personal life. He wasn't being distracted by what's happening in somebody else's life 
or what's happening in the country, he did an introspection of his own life and realized that he needed the revival power of God in his own heart. And so those nine times in Psalm 119, he asked God and he prays, revive me, O Lord. With that in mind, Charles Finney was an American Presbyterian minister, the most famous revivalist and also a leader in the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening was a widespread revival that took place in the United States of America. And Charles Finney was one of the preachers that God used mightily during that revival. He preached during that revival from 1825 to 1835, 10 years. God used him mightily in revival. And four of the books that Charles Finney wrote tells us about his experiences with revival and also his understanding of revival. And these four books, I believe, contain a whole lot of what he said or had to say and write about revival. Now, he said a lot of things. He preached a lot of sermons. You could find a lot of information on Charles Finney. All you have to do is Google it, and you'll find a whole lot of information on this revivalist preacher. But in these four books, I think he, he kind of brings a whole lot of his experiences and his understanding and the things that God showed him about revival into these writings. Book one is Lectures on Revival. Book two is How to Experience Revival. Book three is Principles of Revival. And book four is Holy Spirit Revivals. Now, if you have any interest in revival at all, all of these books are on Amazon, and plus the, the other 60 or so books that uh, Charles Finney wrote, they're on Amazon. But what he has put together about revival, I think, is the most comprehensive set of work, works on revival by any one single preacher. And so when we talk about revival, as we are going to from this point forward, personal revival in particular, when I mention him or when I quote him, we are quoting somebody who knows what revival is, well, he's dead now, but who knew what revival is supposed to be, who understood it, and who also experienced it. So he's not just writing out of something he read somewhere, He's writing out of his own personal experience with revival. And one of the things this revivalist preacher said was that personal revival is needed when a Christian becomes backslidden in heart. Personal revival is needed when a Christian becomes backslidden in heart. Now, we are not talking, or he's not talking, about totally backsliding and moving away completely and totally from God. He's not talking about abandoning God and uh, turning your back on a salvation that you once embraced. That is absolute backsliding. What he's talking about is still maintaining a relationship with Jesus as personal Savior and Lord, but at the same time, that relationship not being as deep and as involved with Jesus as it ought to be because we have withdrawn ourselves from certain things connected to that relationship. So while we are still saying that we are Christian and still doing a lot of the things that may, may be characterizes a Christian's life, the depth deep down in our hearts, we are disconnected in many ways. We'll explain. But Finney said this about backsliding in heart, to give us an understanding of this. Because when we find ourselves in this condition, we need a personal revival. Not the whole church, me. 
Me, if I am backslidden in heart, I need a personal revival. And so do you. So Finney, Charles Finney, describes black backsliding in heart in four ways. Number one, he says, backsliding in heart consists in taking back that consecration to God and his service that constitutes true conversion. Now, all he simply means is when we first gave our lives to Jesus Christ and when we first had that encounter with God as an unbeliever and that encounter with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, our desire to commit our lives to him and dedicate our lives to him and consecrate our lives to him was not in question. But over time, he says, we take back some of that consecration that we had in the early beginning of our relationship with God. And what he's saying is, in taking back from God some of that consecration that we might have had, we actually backslid in heart. We didn't walk totally away from him, but we took back for ourselves the level of consecration that we might have had or might have to him. And so he says, that's what backsliding in heart is. When we have lost the degree of consecration that we had for God and to God when we were initially born again. Secondly, he says, backsliding in heart is leaving by a Christian. It is the leaving by a Christian of his first love. When we have left our first love, we are backslidden in heart because you could be in church and still have left your first love. You could still be doing things in church, doing things in ministry, and still have left your first love. Now, Pastor Dave preached, a, preached an awesome sermon on this back when we first started, and so um, I'm not going to get into that. If you missed it, then go online, uh, go to the website, go on YouTube or, or Facebook, and you'll be able to see the sermon there. But that's the second way that Charles Finney describes backsliding in heart. Number three, he says, backsliding in heart consists in the Christian's withdrawing himself from that state of entire and universal devotion to God, which constitutes true religion and coming again under the control of a self-pleasing spirit. So he says, backsliding in heart is when we withdraw ourselves from totally giving ourselves over and total devotion to God. As Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. He says, when we withdraw from that, and then put ourselves back under the control of a self-pleasing spirit, we are backslidden in heart. Because we are now back in a position or condition where we are now led by self as opposed to being led by God. Our total devotion is moved away from God to ourselves. And one, one time back early in our relationship with God, when our total devotion was God, we are now not there because we have taken some of it back and in order to please ourselves. Because, you know, being totally devoted for God calls for sacrifices. And human nature does not want to sacrifice. And so instead of remaining totally devoted to God, uh, uh, wholly uh, devo devoted to God, because we want to please ourselves in certain ways. You know, there are certain things that I want to do. There are certain things that I like. There are certain things that I don't like. We pull ourselves away in order to please that part of us, as opposed to being wholly devoted to God and letting him control and direct the shots of our lives. Number four, he says, uh, he describes being backslidden in heart this way. 
when all the outward forms and appearances of religion are maintained while the power of God to change our lives is denied. We are backslidden in heart when we maintain the outward appearances of what Christianity looks like, the outward appearances of what being a Christian looks like, what being born again looks like, we maintain the outward things related to that, but we deny the power of God to totally and completely change our lives. In other words, we have no problem coming to church. We have no problem engaging in worship. We have no problem uh, serving in ministry. Whatever it is, the outward stuff, we have no problem doing it. And we have no problem dealing with it. But when God points his finger at us and when God puts his finger upon our chest and says to us, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to live. This is what you need to let go of. This is what you need to stop doing. This is what you need to get your life to a point where it is totally sold out to me. And we refuse to let that level of God's power work in our lives. When we do so, Charles Finney says, we are backslidden in heart. And then he goes on and gives some evidences of what it is to be backslidden in heart. Now, I didn't write these, so don't, put, don't throw no rocks at me. He gives us 12, this is Charles Finney, one of the great revivalists known to mankind. He gives us 12 evidences of what being backslidden in heart looks like. So he says, when you see these things in your life, you're backslidden in heart. Or you're on your way to becoming backslidden in heart. Let me just give them to you as he has written them. Number one, we just talked about it, formality in religious exercises. In other words, uh, 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 you know, our Christianity, our Christian life, our church life is just a formal thing. We go through the motions with it. You know, we come to church, we do these things, but it's just, it's just a formality. When your Christian life becomes just a formality instead of a reality, Finney says, you're backslidden in heart. Number two, he says, a lack of religious enjoyment. Evidence number two, a lack of religious or spiritual enjoyment. Now, he wrote this years ago, so he uses the word religious or religion, whereas we today would use the word Christian, Christianity, or spiritual or spirituality. But he says, when we look at our lives and we have no spiritual enjoyment, in our lives, it could very well be because we are backslidden in heart. The greatest oxymoron there is, in my estimation, is a joyless Christian. A Christian in whose life there is no joy. Uh, you know, they might have joy watching the Super Bowl. You know, oh, yeah, rah, yeah, rah, yeah. but when it comes to the things of God, there is no joy. Because how can you be connected to the God of the universe? The one who spoke and all of this came into existence. Jesus Christ as the one who the scripture says maintains everything that God has created. How can you be connected to a spiritual source like that and have no joy? About it. About your Christian life. How, how could it possibly be? The Bible says that in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. As a Christian, 
in spite of what happens around you, in spite of what happens to you, in spite of what's going on in the world, you should still be a person who deep down on the inside, in spite of all of that other stuff, you still have a joy down on the inside. As a matter of fact, we should be the ones who are filled with joy, exuding joy, and showing joy when the rest of the people around us thinks that the world is coming apart and the world is coming to pieces. We should be the ones to stand up before them and show them that there's something different between me because I'm connected to the God of the universe and you and the rest of the world who have no hope, who have no joy, who have no peace in their lives. So for us, if we've lost our joy, it could be that we're backslidden in heart. Number three, he says, I'm preaching these more than I'm supposed to. Number three, he says, is religious bondage. Where people are just in bondage to religion and religiosity. You know, like in our beautiful Bahama land where, you know, it's our custom to go to church on Sunday whether you are Christian or not. It's our custom to acknowledge spiritual things. It's our custom to open our parliament with a prayer. You know, and you know, all of these things are what we do as Bahamians, and I thank God for it all. But you know, there are lots of people, not only here in our country, but around the world, who only see Christianity as that and that alone. No personal connection, no personal transformation, no renewal in their lives, but just a motion that they go through, just a formality that they go through, and it has them in bondage instead of them experiencing the liberty that is in Jesus Christ. And so, you could be, let me just give you one example. You could be, Getting up 6 o'clock every morning, going to 7 o'clock mass, and don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Let me bring it home a little closer. You could get up every morning and come here 8.30 or 11 o'clock to come to church and not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. But it's the religiosity that drives you, the religiosity that pushes you because you are convinced that it's the right thing to do. And it very well is the right thing to do, but you have not allowed the power of it to change and transform your life. So it's like a bondage. Same thing, all the time, but no real relationship. Number four, he says, uh, evidence of being backslidden in heart is a spirit of unkindness. He's talking, he's talking to Christians. Number five is a critical and fault finding spirit. Charles Finney said that way back in 1825 to 1835. Backsliding in heart is also a lack of interest in God's word. If I claim to be a Christian, but has absolutely no interest in reading God's word, then how can I justifiably say that I am? Because if I have no interest in reading what he says to me, what he is speaking to me through the written word, if I have no interest in hearing what he has to say, then that definitely speaks about the kind of relationship that I have with him. Because I am saying I know him, but I don't want to hear anything that he has to say. He's not interested in the word. Number seven, he says, is a lack of interest in prayer. Prayer is communicating with God. 
So if I say that I am a Christian, but I have no interest in talking to the God that I say I'm connected to, in talking to the Savior that I say is my personal Savior and Lord, if I don't have any interest in doing that, communing with him, then how can I say I'm connected to him? The tenth thing he says Pardon me, uh, the ninth thing he says, the ninth evidence is the loss of interest in truly spiritual conversation. You know, there are a lot of Christian people, they'll talk to you about anything besides Jesus. They'll talk politics with you till the cows come home. They'll talk about their family. They'll talk about their job. They'll talk about their disgusting boss. You know, they'll talk about, to talk about anything, talk about world uh, uh, conditions and things that are happening around the world. They'll even talk to you about Ukraine and Russia. But they'll never initiate a conversation about God or a conversation about Jesus Christ and relationship with him. They'll never in the, uh, uh, initiate a conversation by saying to you, well, you know, guess what I read in the word this morning? And initiate a conversation. That ain't happening, brother. Charles Finney says, you're backslidden in art. Let me go on, give you these last three. Number 10, he says, is a self-indulgent spirit. When you are more interested in yourself than you are God and the things of God, even though you say you are a Christian, you're backslidden in heart, he says. Number 11 is a sad conscience. In other words, God can't even get through to you. Your conscience is sad. No conviction of anything. You hear a, you hear a sermon and it speaks to you and, 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 and uh, 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 speaks to something that's happening in your life. But you refuse to let it get through to bring the kind of conviction that will result in a change of heart and life because your conscience is sad. You, it, you won't let it get through. And then lastly, he says, loose and moral principles. If you're living a life with loose and moral principles, Charles Finney says, you're backslidden in heart. As a Christian, living loose, more, loose moral principles, living like that, he says, is contrary to the life that is ours in Christ Jesus as outlined in God's word. Loose moral living is the exact opposite of true biblical Christian living. So if that's happening, backslidden in heart. Not totally uh, walked away from God, you know, but not really living for him the way we should. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's all Charles Finney said and everything that I just read from him. Honor with mouth, but hearts are far from him. Now, here's the crux of the matter. When we realize that we are backslidden in heart, when we realize that this is the condition of our souls, what do we do? Because I know one thing. I, 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 I have had these kinds of experiences. And if I find myself backslidden in heart, if any of those things that Charles Finney says applies to me and I am backslidden in heart, that's not a place that I want to be. That's not a place in my relationship with God where I want to be. And so please tell me what can I do to get out of that condition and position in my life. Please tell me, Pastor, what can I do to solve the problem of being a backslider in heart? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you four things that have worked for me when I have walked through these kinds of experiences. Four things. Number one, admit that you're backslidden in heart and need a personal revival. That's the first thing you have to do. Admit it. You know, but you know, human nature uh, uh, leads us and pushes us to engage in self-denial. But I don't know what he's talking about. Ain't nothing wrong with me. I try my best. 
Ain't nothing wrong in me. I ain't perfect. But I don't self-denial. You know, self-denial because we do not want to just simply admit, yeah, I have a problem, okay? I understand. I see. I see what you're saying. I see what the word is saying. I, I, I understand where I am now. Okay, now what can I do? All right? But we have to first admit. You know, sometimes we, may, we just make all kinds of excuses. All kinds of excuses. We blame other people. Well, you know, if they never said that to me, I would have been better off today in my Christian life. You know, we blame situations that happen. All because we don't want to take responsibility for the spiritual condition that we find ourselves in. But here's what the scripture says. David, the psalmist, we'll get to him in a few minutes in a different, uh, in, a, in a broader way. But David, after he had uh, taken Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, impregnated her, and then had her husband killed on the battlefield, conspired together with his generals to have her husband killed on the battlefield, David did not deny that he had a real problem in his life. And so he writes in Psalm 51 verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. I acknowledge my transgressions. I acknowledge that I'm backslidden in heart. I acknowledge that I'm not where I ought to be. That's the first step. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So I'm not going to blame my situation on somebody else. I'm not going to try and cover up my condition because of what somebody else might have said or done to me. No, I have a problem, and so I will confess and acknowledge that I do have a problem, and I need some help. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the apostle John wrote, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we realize that we do have a problem, when we realize that there might be a backslidden and heart condition that is existing on the inside of us, the first thing we need to do is admit it. God is waiting for us to say, yes, Lord, I do have a problem here. That's where it all begins. If we never do that, we will never experience personal revival. If our position is always, well, I don't need any personal revival, Pastor. I'm okay. I'm good. I don't need a personal revival. If that's our posture, if that's our decision, if that's the way we are going to look at it, I'm never willing to admit anything that's wrong with our relationship with God that might be there. We'll never experience the revival in our hearts that's necessary. So that's number one. We've got to admit that we are in a backslidden condition and we are in need of a personal revival. The second thing that we should do in order to be released from this position and condition in our lives is to repent. Repent is a word that Christians are afraid of because of what it sounds like and because of what we have heard preachers say over the years. But repentance is something that's very simple. It's very simple. Repentance is a change of heart and mind that results in a change of direction and life. That's all it is. A change of heart and mind about something that results in a change of direction and life. One of my teachers in Bible college illustrated it this way. He said, this is what repentance is. You are living your life and you are walking in this direction. This is what you have decided you're going to do. This is what you want to be, yada, yada, yada. You're walking in this direction and all of a sudden God speaks to you. God says something to you and you realize that you're going in the wrong direction. 
And when it hits you between the eyes, he said repentance is knowing that you're going in that wrong direction, so you want to change your mind about that, and you turn, you totally turn 180 degrees and start walking in the new direction that God leads you into. That is repentance. And sometimes we say, oh, I repent, I repent, I repent. But we don't change our thinking, we don't change our mind, and we don't change our direction. But if you are, if, if you are going to be delivered from a backslidden spirit, and you are going to be set free to be the, the one who experiences a personal revival from God, you've got to repent. King David that I mentioned earlier, I don't have the time to go into the story, but Nathan the prophet came to the palace to see the king. And Nathan the prophet confronted him about what he had done with, Bath, with Uriah and Bathsheba, his wife. And Nathan said to David, you're wrong in what you did. Remember, God said about David that he was a man after my own heart. So where was David when he took this man's wife, impregnated her, and had him killed on the battlefield? He certainly wasn't in the heart of God. And so he went through a moment of being backslidden in heart. And Nathan approaches and confronts him about it. David was the king of Israel. But David didn't say, how dare you come into this palace and talk to me, the king, in this way. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know I can say the word right now and have your head severed from your body? Don't you know that God anointed me as king from I was 17 years old? Don't you know that I succeeded King Saul? Don't you know that I am the greatest king that this nation has ever had? How dare you come in here and handle me this way? David didn't do it. David didn't do it because he realized he was wrong. He had a heart after God. He had a backslidden moment, but when Nathan the prophet pointed that prophetic finger at him, his heart was pricked, and he realized that he had to quickly admit what had happened, repent of what had happened, and believe God to get his life back in order. So he wrote these words in Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David didn't want to remain in that condition. In verses 10 through 12, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. David said, I will admit my situation. I will repent of my situation because I want to be delivered from it. No excuses. No pointing of the finger. No blaming anybody else. I am the man. The third thing we need to do is renew our hunger and thirst for God. We need to renew it to be set free from that backsliding in heart and to experience a personal revival. Renew our hunger and thirst for God. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the water brooks, 
So pants my soul for you, O God. You see, when we're in that backslidden and hard condition, we're not panting after God, no seeking after God, no longing after God, because we are in a backslidden and hard condition. But David says, the psalmist says, in order to help us get out of that and in order to help us renew our hunger and our thirst for God, a new thirsting, a new hunger, a new seeking after God has to be a part of our lives. We have to start over, so to speak. He says, as the day pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. As my soul first for God, for the living God. He uses the picture of a deer out in the wilderness. And moving through the wilderness eventually works up a thirst in his body. But because he's in the wilderness, there are not many places in the wilderness to catch a drink of water. And so he moves throughout the wilderness seeking some place to find water to quench his thirst. And the psalmist says, like that deer goes through the wilderness looking and seeking, trying to find something to quench the thirsting within his body. He says, just as that deer is longing for water, I am longing and thirsting for God. That's how we renew what we've lost. He also says in Psalm 63 verse 1, the psalmist, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. In Psalm 84 verse 2, the psalmist says, My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. To experience a personal revival when we find ourselves in a backslidden and hard condition, we must renew our thirst and our hunger for God. And here's what happens when we do that. Here's what God says. He will do when we do the seeking and the thirsting and the hungering for him. Psalm 107 verse 9, it says, For he, God, satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. God says, you do the seeking, I'll do the filling. You do the, 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 the crying out and I will give you the answer. Let me see your hunger and I'll fill your hungry soul with goodness. God says, every time you seek, you shall find. Then uh, Jesus said these words, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So when God sees us in the condition that we are in, and then we begin to reach out to him, we admit that we have a problem, we repent, we renew our hunger and everything, God responds to it all because he wants us to be all that he desires us to be. And not living in less than he has for us. Now let me give you number four. The fourth thing that we need to do, admit that we need a personal revival, repent, renew our hunger for God, and number four, pray for the rekindling of the Holy Spirit's fire. I said to the early service this morning, I grew up in church. And I could remember, though not as clearly as I'd like to, but I could remember as a boy in Sunday school saying the sinner's prayer and giving my life to Jesus. I knew that happened. But it wasn't until age 21, because you know how we go. We get saved young and then the world becomes so appealing and all sorts of other things we are attracted to that pull us away from God, pull us away from church, pull us out of our relationship with God. Well, that happened to me. 
and it wasn't until age 21 that I really encountered the risen Savior. At age 21, and listen, at age 21, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I had a fire inside of me that I could not describe. I didn't even know what it was all about. But one thing I did know, that Jesus Christ had transformed my life. And the fire of God burned in me at age 21. I don't care who you was. If I came up to you and if something said to me that you weren't born again, I'd share the gospel with you. Even if something didn't say something to me, I would share the gospel with you. Whether it was family, whether it was friends, whether it was co-workers, whether it was a man on the street, no matter where it was, the fire of God burned so deeply and strongly inside that I would witness to anybody. The fire of God was so hot and so strong. Even at that young age, I could not get enough of the Bible. And we have a Bible reading program that we're running now to help you read through the Bible in a year's time. For those of you who are not doing it, let me encourage you to do so. Because it would be a wonderful thing for you to one day be able to say, you know, I read the whole Bible. Amazing. But when the fire of God was burning in me at age 21, I read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation in the old King James Version with all the these and thou's and thine and everything else in less than a year. Because the fire of God, I couldn't get enough of the word. I didn't understand everything, but I read and I read and I read and I read. When Pastor Dave then was still sleeping in the morning, I'd get up and go outside by myself in the back of the yard and read and read and read and pray. Now, he was only sleeping because he was younger. He wasn't sleeping because he didn't want to do that. He was younger. But... That was because of the fire of God on the inside. Even at that young age, at 21. But you see, as time went on, the fire began to wane. Not as hot as it was. It wasn't as life-changing as it was. It wasn't because the fire was any different. It was because I was. And I was not in the same position with God as I was at age 21. Now, my Christian life is a transparent one. I ain't got nothing to hide from anybody. I have gone through these kinds of experiences a number of times in my Christian life. Even at times when I was sitting in Bible college, being trained for the ministry, being taught in theology, I wasn't on fire for God like I should have been. There have been times over the years that I preach sermons in churches, fiery sermons, perhaps just like I'm doing right now, preaching my guts out until I started to see stars like I was going to fall out on the platform, preaching so hard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I wasn't where I knew I ought to have been in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about living in sin. I'm not talking about committing sin. I'm talking about just simply drawing away and being detracted and, and, and looking at other stuff, looking at other things in life, you know, other things that you want to do, other things that you want to accomplish that pulled away from the main thing. Yes, I knew I was called to ministry. Yes, I knew I was going to be in full-time ministry someday. But from time to time, I needed a personal revival. I needed the fire of God to burn once again. Listen to me. 
John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I, one mightier than I, Jesus, one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus, he said, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We don't have any problem talking about being baptized in the Spirit. But when it comes to Holy Spirit baptism and fire, some of us get a little shaky. Fire. Boy. What can happen to me when that happens? I can roll on the floor like that. I can jump up and down uncontrollably like, huh? Uh, I don't think I want that. And part of the reason that we take that approach to the baptism, the Holy Spirit's baptism in fire is because there's a false fire that has entered the church of Jesus Christ over the years. It's a false fire that focuses on the flesh rather than the spirit. The fire of the spirit might impact your flesh. But you can't put it in reverse and call the fire of the flesh the fire of the spirit. That's what turns people away sometimes. Now when the fire of the spirit burns in you and the fire of the spirit is all over you and the fire of the spirit is blazing in your life, you might do some things that you don't ordinarily do. You might roll on the floor. I'm just saying, not because your flesh wants to roll on the floor or not because somebody else tells you you need to roll on the floor or because you, 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 you need to roll on the floor if you're going to have the fire. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit. Alone, burning so hot and burning so deep on the inside that he takes total control of your life, control of your body, control of your mind, control of your spirit, control of your soul. John said, that's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and he's going to baptize you with fire. You see, we are sometimes afraid of fire because fire consumes and destroys. So we're afraid of it. But there's no need to be afraid of God's fire or the Holy Spirit's fire because the fire of the Holy Spirit does consume and destroy those things that are in us that are not from God. Those things that are trying to control our lives and, and pull us away from God and keep us in a life of disobedience to God. The Holy Spirit's fire will consume and destroy those things and we need it to. But the Holy Spirit, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit or fire also warms and heats. Fire also purges and purifies our hearts like gold that is tried in the fire, the scripture says. So we are purged and purified by fire. So it doesn't, we don't have to be afraid of the fire of the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Holy Spirit in you might look different from the fire of the Holy Spirit in me. But what we need is the fire of the Holy Spirit in us. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. We are assemblies of God and we still believe this. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Stick a pin. Before there was ever tongues, there was fire. The first thing that sat on them were flames like fire. I don't know if it was literal fire, but I do know it was Holy Spirit fire. And these tongues of fire, the scripture says, sat on each of them. So just like John the Baptist said Jesus would do, he sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit baptized them in fire. And then the scripture goes on and says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus said, or just like John said Jesus would do. They were filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit and they were filled with the Holy Spirit which manifested in the speaking of other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We need this fire again. There are many of us in this church who speak in tongues. We have no problem with that. We believe that. That's what we are about as evangelistic temple and as an Assemblies of God church. We believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. But what about the fire? Huh? What about the fire? You see, the fire is going to do something else on the inside of us. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is going to do something on the inside of us as well. But the fire is also going to do something inside of us. Don't let the devil rob you of the fire. I close with this. I gave you this quote way back in January when I was preaching about revival from Selwyn Hughes. And it says... Revival is God bending down to the dying embers of a fire that is just about to go out and breathing into it until it bursts into flame again. He says, God looks at your life and mine when we are in need of a personal revival. And he hears our cry to him for a personal revival. Our fire is almost out or our fire is completely out. But we want this fire renewed in us again. And Hughes says that revival, this personal revival, is like God bending down. Heaven touches earth and God breathes into our fire that's about to go out. And he doesn't stop until it erupts into a flame once again. That's what we need in this church again. That's what we need in our lives again. The raving, raging fire of the Holy Spirit. Fire in the pastors, fire in the board, fire in the Sunday school teachers, fire in the musicians, fire in the calm, in the choir, fire in the ushers, fire in the greeters, and fire in all of you. If we are not a church of fire, we will only be walking in, in, in half of what Jesus said he wants to do for us. And that's the baptism in the spirit, but not the baptism in fire. What do we want? I have never been in a backslidden and hard condition when I was happy or where I was happy. No, it's not a pleasant thing to experience. It's a hurtful thing to experience. 
There have been times when I've needed a personal revival. Just needed to get back again. Just get fired up again. You know? And not just doing things in the church and, and doing things in the ministry because, you know, God has gifted you to do it, enabled you to do it, equipped you to do it, and all of that stuff, but doing it because there's a raging fire on the inside that I cannot help but do what I do and be who I am in God. I don't want to pastor a church that doesn't want the fire of God. I don't want to be a Christian living a life that's minus the fire of God. And so that's our cry for 2023. That's our cry. Stand to your feet, please.